Look, um, basically I found with, with uh, these groups like yourselves and, and other groups that come in here, um, I get paid to talk, so I could sit and stand and talk to you for hours. Um, but I might talk about lollipops in the moon or something. I prefer to talk about things that you're interested in. Uh, so usually the best way to do that is to let you ask questions. People that come into Hebron usually have questions, uh, whether it be directly about Hebron or, or anything else um, that might be on your mind. Um, so um, I always preface question and answers by telling people uh, that I do work with the news media. There's nothing I haven't heard, okay? Every once in a while, somebody pops a new question on me, but I've heard just about everything there is to hear, so you don't have to worry about offending me. You can ask me whatever you want. You might not like my answers, um, but I try to tell it the way it is, the way representing the community. Um, okay, you asked, you had your hand up first. You mentioned your honor earlier. Excuse me? You mentioned your honor earlier. Yes. And the rhetoric that's been going back and forth. And, you know, there's the argument that says, uh, Akhil Yajad was mistranslated. He said he wanted to wipe the Israeli regime off the map, not, not Israel. As someone who lives in Hebron, and as someone who identifies himself as a Jew, does that even matter to you? Um, first of all, I, I think, actually I haven't seen what you just said, but I think it's very clear because he's, he said it so many times in so many different ways that, that it's very clear what his intent is. And he said that he didn't say that Netanyahu was a cancer, he said that, that the Jews are a cancer, that Israel is a cancer. And, and, and in the end, in the end you, know, you, you can try to you know, pick and choose a word here, a word, he, word there. But it's very clear what his intention is. Okay, he, 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 he doesn't make any bones about it. He's very honest. He says he wants to wipe Israel off the map. Okay? Um, you know, and that's what we have to deal with. You know, that's, that's the point. There, there are a lot of, of side issues, which we've heard a little bit about this week. Um, I think uh, Israeli foreign ministers talked about, and a few of the others talked about, how if Iran is allowed to uh, continue with a nuclear weapon program, then you're going to have other countries in the region also develop, developing nuclear weapons to counter what Iran is doing. But that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's a side issue. He wants to destroy Israel. Uh, that's his purpose. Uh, he say, sees that as a, as a, uh, as almost a, you know, a divine commandment. Uh, and uh, that's what we're dealing with. Very, very simply. Yeah. Um, okay. So I grew up with us, and I always, as far as I feel, as I was in, in my life. Um, but I was wondering if whether in your mind, in your community's mind, there's any point at which you would decide that um, the preservation of human life and the quality of life, whether on, on the Jewish side or the Palestinian side, takes precedence over access to a historical monument. Um, everybody hear the question? Um, the question, you know, is what takes precedence? You know, the place or people's lives, people. Um, you can say the same thing even on a, you know, on a little higher scale about the Kotel, you know, the Western Wall in Jerusalem, or Temple Mount. Um, and and that's, a, that's a very, very uh, uh, important question. Um, so the first question, in, the first element in trying to deal with a question like that is, you know, where's the red line? You know, wh where does it end? Okay? Uh, does it end with the two of the patriarchs in Hebron? Does it end with uh, the Kotel, the uh, Western Wall in Jerusalem, or perhaps with Tel Aviv? Because the map that I have in my office uh, that was printed by the Palestinian Authority in Bethlehem of Palestine uh, is a map of Israel which calls Tel Aviv Tel Al-Arabi. Okay, so the question is then, you know, where do I stop? Um, there's also a question of, of, of history and heritage. In other words, um, there's also a question of, of freedom of religion, freedom to worship. Um, had situations be different, had there been uh, Islamic control of Hebron for 700 years, when everybody had the right to worship wherever they wanted to worship, then, then that question or my response might be different. Um, however, it was off limits. Uh, we know the same thing today about Temple Mount. 
Temple Mount, which is considered to be the holiest place in the world for a Jew, keeping in mind that Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, and Hebron aren't mentioned in the Quran anywhere. Okay? So, so you take that and say, um, uh, why can't I... They want to pray there, they're praying there. I don't have the, the capability, even if I want to today, to stop that. But why is a Jew who goes up onto Temple Mount, the areas where it's today considered to be permissible for a Jew to go, and there are areas that are off-limits by Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, law where it's forbidden to go, but for if I go up there and I move my mouth and say some psalms, then the guys from the WAC, the Muslim Religious Trust, call over the Israeli police and soldiers and say, he's praying here, he's not allowed to do that, throw him off. Okay, and then they put my name on a list and I'll never go back up there again. Okay? So, so we then have to try to examine what's the, what's the target, what's the aim. The aim isn't just that it belongs to me and it doesn't belong to you. The aim is it all belongs to me and none of it belongs to you. Okay? And, and so, you know, why should I, I... You know, you're trying to survive. Basically, in the end, it's a, it's a battle for survival. You want to survive. Uh, and, and all the way on the other side of that is... Um, you know, just to take as a, we can take a couple of examples. Okay, we can take one outside of the United States. Let's take the, uh, uh, what were they? What are they called? Those those islands that uh, were uh, were uh, the British islands, huh? Falkland Islands. Falkland Islands. They had a big war. The Argentinians said they belonged to me. The British said they belonged to me. They had a big war. How many people were killed about the islands that didn't endanger anybody? You know, it had nothing to do with, with anybody. It didn't, it didn't, it wasn't an existential danger to the British if it belonged to them or not. But they went out and had a big war. But let's just forget that. Let's just take, take what would happen if today, you know, um, you know, the next bin Laden, he should never exist, okay? But, but let's say there's another one and he starts little terrorist attacks here and there in the United States and says, you know what? I'm willing to stop the terror. You know, after he's killed a few a few tens of thousands of people in different cities in the States. He says, I'm willing to stop the terror, you know, just give me Boston. You give me Boston, and I leave everything else alone. Anybody in their right mind say yes? Of course not. Of course not. So why, with my 4,000 years of history here, say, I, I can't pray there? I'm not allowed to live there? I'm not allowed to be here? Doesn't doesn't make any sense. Yes. Yes. Uh, the question is whether you know there are people from from prior to 1929. Uh, there are. Um, there are a few. There are a few. Not a whole lot. Um, we're in touch with most of the. There aren't too many survivors alive. There are a few of them still alive. We're in touch with them and some of the families. A lot of them, um, there are those that have come back. There are those that haven't come back, um, and they still talk about the trauma, and they refuse to come back. There is a, uh, a woman who lives up here. Actually, whose husband was killed in a terrorist attack in Hebron 14 years ago, uh, who is uh, uh, directly related to one of the families that was here then uh, that, uh, that were saved. They were actually uh, saved by an Arab who stood in the doorpost of their house and wouldn't let the, <coughs> the others in, even when they threatened to kill him. Uh, there are a few families, I, not a whole lot. There are three or four families in Hebron who have, have a, a relationship to people that lived here prior to 1929. Yes? Um, look, today Hebron, uh, life, life, uh, day to day living in Hebron, um, I can divine it in, in different ways. In one sense, it's very normal, and in a, another sense, it's very abnormal. Excuse me. Today, I, as a Jew in Hebron, have access to about three percent of the city. From the tomb of the patriarchs, coming down the street here, which is basically the only street we have, to, we can use. Going up the hill to the Tel Umeda neighborhood, it's about a kilometer and a half. That's that's the only access we have to the city. The, most of the city, the majority of the city, uh, we call the other side of the city today, we have absolutely no access to. The Arabs today in Hebron have access to about 97% of the city. The only area that's restricted to them is from outside here, going down about, uh, I don't know, half a kilometer, three quarters of a kilometer down in the direction of the Tomb of the Patriarchs. 
Um, so that's, that's abnormal because your living space is very, very, very confined. Uh, there are people that define it as ghetto. I don't particularly like that word. Uh, we left Eastern Europe to get out of the ghetto. Uh, but it, it's very constricted and very confined. On the other hand, within the area that we are, we live fairly, we live fairly normally. I mean, you know, people, uh, it, because the area that we're in today is very small, most of the space that we have allocated to us is utilized either for housing or for things for the kids. We have small office space uh, in one of the other neighborhoods, um, but we don't have room for stores, shopping centers, things like that, which they do have on the other side of the city. Um, over here, people may want to go shopping, so we go up to Kiryat Arba, which is five minutes away. You know, it's no big deal. Um, but uh, uh, living is, is as normal as that can be within the uh, confines of what we have here. The kids play in the streets, you know, they have bicycles, they can ride around. Um, in the city itself, we have nursery schools and kindergartens. The kids go from first grade and up, up to uh, here at Arba, where we have different uh, educational institutions there. Um, and, uh, and the like, people work. There isn't a whole lot to do here in the city because of the space constrictions. <clears throat> so there are some people, I work here in our offices, there are people that have independent businesses. Uh, there are people that work in Kiryat Darba and schools and small businesses and people go to Jerusalem. It's a half hour away. <coughs> so that's, <clears throat> that's basically in terms of day-to-day of -day life. There are times, there was a period of time during uh, the Second Intifada 10, 11 years ago, uh, 12 years ago, when, uh, when the shooting started. It was shooting at us for a few years uh, when life was a little bit more difficult. It got a little hairy. But, uh, but for the most part, we try to live as normally as we possibly can. Um, in a scenario, you had a creation of a Palestinian state and this area was under that control, but they gave you the option of continuing to live here. Would you live here in the Palestinian state? That's a very good question. Um, I don't have a definitive answer to that question. Um, it's something that, uh, first of all, a as a rule, I try to speak representing the community. I, you know, everybody, there are always nuances in, here and there, but uh, that's a question which we certainly haven't had any, um, you know, uh, policy meetings about or discussions or what would we do or what wouldn't we do, whether it be on an individual basis or on a community basis or like that. And there are different opinions. I've heard people say, I would never leave. I don't care who's here. Uh, I've heard other people say, I came to live you know, in Israel. I didn't come to live in Palestine. So if I want to live in a state under somebody else's rules, so, you know, I can live in, in Switzerland or in England or in France or in the United States, why live here? I and mean, it's true that Hebron is Hebron, but, but if I'm not living under Israeli rule, then, you know, <coughs> um, it's a very, um, I very honestly believe that that scenario will never uh, present itself as an actuality. Uh, for two reasons. Um, number one, I don't believe that there'll ever be a Palestinian state as such. And number two, uh, because if, God forbid, that were to happen, um, even though it has been talked about, I have seen articles about it, I have great difficulty believing that any Israeli government would ever pull out and leave us here because the, the, uh, the results are inevitable. Okay, I have no doubt about what would happen. Uh, and even though I have, have seen it talked about, um, I, I don't believe that anybody, any Israeli government would ever do that. They wouldn't say, we're leaving, you know, worry about yourselves. Just wouldn't happen. Yeah. Hey, um, thank you so much uh, for speaking with us, sir. Um, uh, sir, you know, uh, we're going to be meeting with the Hebron Rehabilitation Committee. So this is the committee that serves the Arabs. So I'm, I'm just curious, have you looked into building any cooperative efforts with the Arabs over here? And also, in the case that you know, there is a Palestinian state created, and you are not evacuated, but given full protection and access to the religious sites, and religious sites, and so on and so forth, what would your personal opinion be upon that? Tov, um, starting with your second question, um, That the, basically, the, did everybody hear the question? The, the fundamental um, basis of that question is, you know, 
you're given full, you know, you're promised full security. Uh, let's just stop with that. You're promised full security, okay? I don't buy it. I don't believe it. It, it, it. We've never seen it happen, and I don't believe we'd see it happen today. Um, promises are, um, I, don't, I don't think they're worth the paper they're written on. And that's not because of what I think, it's just what experience teaches us. Okay? Um, when Israel signed the Oslo Accords, they were signed together with the Palestinian Authority. Yasser Arafat signed the Hebron Accords which split the city. Yet we came under immediate attack following the signing and implementation of those accords. We saw, we have to, we have to also learn from our experiences. That doesn't mean that things can't change, but you have to, you have to take into account what's happened in the past. Okay, what I showed you in that room in there was perpetrated by the people that they lived with. It wasn't people that came from, you know, Egypt, Egypt and Algeria, you know, to massacre everybody and then they left. Uh, I've read, read that uh, there was a child who was able to name 18 of the people in his house who were massacring his family because he knew them all. Okay, so we haven't seen any, any, um, any kind of um, proof in any way, shape, or form that that's changed. It doesn't mean that tomorrow somebody's going to, you know, all of a sudden everybody's going to come out with axes. They don't need axes today. People have weapons today. They have, they have automatic weapons. That doesn't mean it'll happen tomorrow or the next day. Uh, but that's, I, I don't see any reason. I don't, I don't believe that we'd have, ever have any kind of security here. What would my personal decision be? I have no idea. I have no idea. I've never given it that kind of consideration where I have to decide that's an extremely, extremely important decision, which also has to take into account many different factors uh, which I haven't investigated. I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. The first part of your question dealing with the HRC, um, do we have any contact with them? No, we don't. We don't have any contact with the HRC. The HRC is funded by the European Union, by the British Embassy, by you name it, the British, the French, the Germans, the Spanish, the Italians. Uh, and if you wander around a in the areas where they're, um, where they're today uh, renovating, uh, you see the signs on the walls. Um, if you're meeting with them, it would be interesting for you to ask them, hoping that they tell you the truth, um, you know, what are the conditions they're giving to people that are moving in, uh, or if they have, I, they put, they have, they, have, they have a website, and they have material up on the website that shows what the source of the buildings are. In other words, um, if, if you take, uh, just, I mentioned earlier twice the hills of Hebron surround us. I showed you a picture in here, about 100 years old, and the picture down here that goes back to the 1970s. The hills were empty. Uh, today there isn't room for a pin on the hills. Okay? Uh, they've all been built up. They've been built up because they didn't need building permits, and we did. So they look the way they do, and we look the way we do. Um, <clears throat> but if you take an old abandoned house, for instance, or if we want to take an old abandoned house and renovate it, so the sky falls in on us, and uh, everybody says, well, where are the permits? And, and ha prove that you own it. Prove that you own this piece of property. Um, the buildings that they're renovating today, they have no proof of ownership for. And they say they do, but they don't. Okay, they have no legal, legal proof of ownership whatsoever, and when we've complained uh, to the Israeli authorities, they're told, well, that's the problem of the Palestinian Authority. Palestinian Authority is paying them to do that. Okay? Um, but we haven't had any contact with them. They're not interested in having any contact with us because their purpose in doing what they're doing is basically to squeeze us out. Uh, that's what they write. Okay, it's, it's in the material that they distribute. If you're interested, when you're finished uh, today, you can go into their website. Uh, they have a couple of documents up in PDF uh, in which they uh, define their goals. And one of their goals is to surround and basically strangle the Jewish community of Hebron, preventing any possible expansion within Hebron or between Hebron and uh, Kiryat Arba, and they say it. I mean, that, that's their stated goal, okay? Um, and the people that they're working with are, are trying to help them uh, to actually achieve this goal. Um, we, we, don't, we don't have any contact with them, no. 
Look, today, look, the relationship between the Jews and the Arabs in Hebron is, is, is interesting. Um, Post-Six-Day post War, after we came back here, there were relationships between Jews and Arabs. Uh, there were personal relationships and there were business relationships. As Jews started to come to live in the city, when we lived in Kiryat Arba, there were relationships, um, positive relationships between Jews and Arabs. <coughs> that started to change towards the middle end of the 1980s, coming into the 1990s during the first Intifada. At that time, <coughs> to the numbers that I recall from way back when, uh, there were over a thousand Arabs that were murdered by other Arabs because they were suspected of collaborating with Israel. Uh, so any Arab with any sense stopped talking to Jews because he was afraid if he was seen talking to a Jew he'd be suspected of being a collaborator and they'd kill him. Um, so that started to bring about a breakdown in relationships. Uh, that led into the Oslo Accords and here in Hebron, the Hebron Accords in 1997, we split the city. At that point the Arabs thought we were on our way out uh, and that very soon we wouldn't be here anymore. Um, <clears throat> that led into the second intifada when they started shooting at us in the hills uh, which lasted for two and a half years uh, and today there's, there's virtually, uh, virtually no positive uh, relationships in the city between Jews and Arabs um, there is a very interesting dialogue that we've had now for a few years <clears throat> with a sheikh named Farid Jabari uh, who lives here in Hebron he's the leader of the largest clan in Hebron. According to what he says, there are hundreds of thousands of people behind him. Um, he's a very interesting man. Um, he, uh, <coughs> of course, we don't, we don't agree eye to eye, but, um, but he himself says that he rejects the idea of a Palestinian state. He rejects the Palestinian Authority primarily because of the corruption. And because he says, he says like this, he says, God gave me all of Israel. He said, it all belongs to me. It doesn't belong to you, it belongs to me. If it all belongs to me, then I'm not willing to give any of it up. Palestinian state means that I'm willing to, I'm willing to, to give you some of what belongs to me from God, and I'm not willing to do that. He said, I prefer to live in the state of Israel as an Israeli than to live in a Palestinian state in which I reject part of the land which I say belongs to me. Uh, it's a very interesting approach. Um, of course, the Israeli government uh, tries to ignore him because the Palestinian Authority is their peace partner and not him, uh, as the United States also. Uh, Jabri is a very, very interesting individual. Uh, we've had numerous meetings with him. I've brought groups to speak to him. And uh, I might suggest you people might also find it, one of the next groups you bring in. Uh, we can help set that up if you want uh, to get to him. Um, uh, he meets people in a big tent. And uh, it's very interesting. He answers questions. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting experience. He's one of the few people, though, that we have a long-term dialogue discussion with. Uh, he called me up before one of the uh, Jewish holidays to tell me, Hag Sameach, have a happy holiday, and I returned the favor before Ramadan. Um, but, uh, but that's unfortunately uh, an exception to the rule. Yeah? Um, I've heard more stories about First of all, I think that the stories are a little bit exaggerated. I think that the adjectives of, of hideous like that are a little bit <coughs> out, of, out of touch with reality. Um, <coughs> look, there's no love lost here between Jews and Arabs. Okay? Um, unfortunately, you know, the, there, there, there seems to be, and, and we see this frequently in the media, a, a very um, interesting equation um, which sort of, you know, it, it takes killing, uh, murder, terror, and, and says, well, that's equal to somebody throwing a rock. Okay? Um, rocks can be fatal. Okay? This week, uh, we're marking the first anniversary of a young man and his baby who were killed because uh, last year their car was caught in a rock attack when a rock went through his windshield, hit him in the forehead, killed him, lost control of the car, and he and his son were both killed. Um, but... Uh, 
children throwing rocks and stuff like that, a, as a rule, usually isn't the same as killing people, you know, shooting at them and stuff like that, blowing them up. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> many times the stories that, that are heard, that you hear about or the, you know, talked about are, uh, are slightly exaggerated. Um, today you can also th see things up on YouTube. Um, now, I also work with film. I work with, with, photo with photography, with video, with stills, and I know that there is this, this uh, new thing in video today that they call editing. You know, you can cut and paste, you can just chop things out. Uh, the children in Hebron, the Jewish children as a rule, try to be honest. In other words, they don't want anything that doesn't belong to them. And if something gi somebody gives them something that doesn't belong to them, then they give it back. Okay? Um, many times, though, in the videos, you don't see that. You see an Israeli kid picking up a rock and throwing it, but you don't see what happened before that. Um, does that mean that nothing ever happens? No. And kids are kids. Uh, the difference, though, I, I, when I, I grew up, I grew, I've been in Israel now for, I don't know, 35, 36 years. But when I grew up as a child in New Jersey, so um, to the best of my recollection, I also threw rocks at my friends. And they usually threw rocks back at me. You know, and then our mothers would get upset with us and they'd yell at us and we'd stop throwing rocks at each other. But it never made um, YouTube or the homepage of MSNBC or CNN or anything else. Here when kids throw rocks at each other, so it's turned into a, you know, a political kind of a thing. Um, as far as I know here in Hebron, I can't speak for other places. As far as I know though, uh, Israeli soldiers have never, never been used to escort uh, children, Arab children. There are places where they have to escort Jewish kids and, and Jewish civilians because of, of terror threats. Um, there are in Hebron numerous um, uh, foreign observer forces, all sorts of different groups that come in here to try to observe and watch that kind of thing. Um, but uh, as a rule, I don't know, I have, my kids are already grown up, but I have grandchildren here. I haven't seen them throwing any rocks at Arab kids, <clears throat> and I'm usually outside. I usually leave in the morning when the kids are leaving, and I haven't seen quite a long time anybody throwing, anybody throwing rocks at anybody else, be there Arabs or Jews or Jews at Arabs. Wait a minute, somebody, you asked a question. Somebody didn't ask a question. Yeah. What brought me to Hebron? I was on a helicopter and somebody pushed me out. Um, um, look, I, um, I came to Israel when I, I grew up in a very normal, reformed, middle-class Jewish family in New Jersey, in the suburb. Um, I came to Israel in 1974 on a one-year program for year in Jerusalem. Um, had every intentions of going back, graduating, going to law school and saving the world. Um, uh, that year changed my life. Um, I went back and graduated. Months later, I came back here and I stayed. I lived, for the most part, in the Jerusalem region. Different areas also, but most part I was around there. Uh, I got married in 1979. That makes me ancient. And then um, uh, we, we moved to Kiryat Arba in 1981. We moved to Kiryat Arba then primarily because... We wanted to do something. Uh, my wife had grown up in Tel Aviv. I grew up where I grew up. And we believed that if you believe in something, do something about it. Just don't just talk about it. And we knew that there was a necessity for people to be in different areas, be it Judea, Samaria, or Gaza. And basically, um, you know, if you want to believe in chance or, you know, divine providence or whatever, whatever anybody believes in, um, uh, we found an apartment in Kiryat Arba that wasn't very expensive. We didn't have any money. Uh, we could afford it. And we moved there. And that got me started to get me involved in what was happening here. I started working here in Hebron 18 years ago. We lived in Kiryat Arba for 17 years. We moved down here 14 years ago. Excuse me, I live here upstairs. And, um, and that's basically the way it evolved. I don't think there was anything specific you know, except maybe God's fingers that pushed me here, but there was nothing, nothing else. That was basically the way it worked. Uh, yeah. Do you feel like that was more application to your life than 
Okay, um, for, in the United States, I didn't carry a gun. In the United States, the only, only place you saw guns was either on television or with police or something like that. I have to tell you that when I came to Israel in 1974, one of the most disconcerting things that I came in touch with, that I remember, okay, and there are a lot of things I don't remember, but I do remember, and I was 1974, I was 20 years old, and I was walking around Jerusalem, we we're talking about a year after the Yom Kippur War, and there were guys younger than me walking around with submachine guns, okay, Uzis, and it drove me crazy. It just totally, it, it was like, you know, it's like landing on Mars. It was very disconcerting. Um, it took me a while before I understood it. Eventually I did understand it. Um, but, uh, and, I, I, and I understand why when people see civilians wandering around with guns, it looks a little, it looks a little strange. Um, <clears throat> um, I've never had to use it. I hope I never had to have to use it. Um, uh, why, do one, why does one carry a gun here? Uh, it's very simple. First of all, you have to be licensed. You can't carry a weapon without being licensed by the Ministry of the Interior or by the uh, IDF, and they usually do very intensive checks to make sure you're not a nut because they're not interested in having crazy people wandering around with weapons. Um, and you issue, issued a, a, a permit for reasons of self-defense. Um, I know people that are alive today because they had a weapon, and I know people that are dead today because they didn't have a weapon. The, uh, <clears throat> does, how, does, how does carrying, how does it make me feel? First of all, I'd much prefer not to have to carry around a gun. For two major reasons. Number one, it pulls my pants down. My wife gets very upset. Uh, the other reason is because it's a, it's a weapon. It's a tool of destruction. Um, it's not the way that people want to live. Um, however, I see it today as basically an obligation. Um, the way terrorist attacks usually work as a rule, is that they happen so fast that by the time you understand what's going on, if you do understand what's going on, if you're still alive, it's usually too late to do anything. Um, you have to have very, 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 very fast reflexes to be able to do anything. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in an area or involved in an area where there is an attack uh, and you can't help people, um, you can't do anything to try to stop it, then, you know, I don't know if there's any feeling that's more helpless. Um, but uh, <clears throat> uh, does it add to apprehension or like that? No. I mean, you get used to it. You know, like you put on a shirt in the morning, you put the thing on your belt. Like I put on my beeper and I put on my cell phone. You know, if it's not there, then you know you feel it. Something's missing. Um, but that's only because of Hergel, because of the you know the re regularity of it for years and years and years. Um, it's not something that's. Uh, it's recommended, but sometimes there are things that are a necessity. You don't have any choice. You're living in a place where there are people are trying to kill you. Look, just, just to understand, okay, for, rather than just talk in the clouds, okay, I live upstairs here. Um, my house, my apartment here has been shot into numerous times. Uh, I take people upstairs and I show them a hole in my son's clothing cabinet with a hole in it. Um, back in the beginning of the year 2001, uh, one night, 11 o'clock at night, I was working down in the office and my, one of my daughters called me and she said, Abba, they're shooting. I said, yeah, they're shooting every night. You know, so what? We had sandbags in the windows. And she said, yeah, but they shot through the window and we were standing there. And I came home and found five holes in the wall without exaggerating, okay? Literally that far from where she and her sister were standing at that time. You know, um, at that point, there was nothing I could do. And, you know, when they were shooting at the apartments, there was nothing we could do. The army was here. They're supposed to take care of it. I had nobody to shoot back at. Uh, but those are things that happen. And there have been uh, instances, too many of them, where they've shot people in the streets or driving or wherever else. Yeah? Um, how often are there like, uh, deadly attacks like that? Uh, thank God. Things have, in that respect, things have, have quieted down. Um, first of all, the, 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 the security forces here work very hard to prevent them. It's not that there isn't any real desire to do it. They work very hard to try to stop it. Uh, and uh, within Hebron today, I won't say that it's impossible. It's difficult. Um, a few weeks ago, a month, yeah, about a month ago, uh, there was a guy here who was attacked. We have a spring up the road here. 
Uh, he went down, I think it was Friday afternoon, to bathe in the spring, and uh, he was all the way down and up top, uh, an Arab threw a fairly large-sized rock at him uh, and hit him in the head, and he was very lucky that he wasn't killed. They opened up his head. Uh, if, he'd been, if he'd been around, turned around the other side, the other day we'd done some work there and they'd taken some of the water out from the very top, he, if he'd fallen in, he would have drowned. He was unconscious. He was, um, um, but they work very hard today to stop the attacks. Uh, there's also today, I won't say 100%, but most terror attacks of today are planned. They're not just sporadic, spontaneous kinds of things. They happen too. Okay, we saw that up in Itamar, the two Arabs that killed the Fogel family up that. They just did it on their own. They wanted to go have an adventure, so they went up and killed five people. Um, but, uh, but for the most part today, they're more planned. And uh, they also have their, uh, their agendas, you know, when they do and when they don't and like that. Um, uh, but there are still our attacks. Uh, two years ago, there was an attack between Hebron and uh, one of the communities in the southern Hebron Hills when a car was shot out in a shoot by, drive by shooting when four people were killed, including parents of, I don't know, six or seven kids. And uh, last year, the, the attack when the Palmer uh, man and his baby were killed uh, on the road just outside of Hebron. Yeah? If all of the West Bank and Hebron was under Israeli jurisdiction and became the state of Israel, would you be willing to allow Canada to be the state of Israel? I guess what I'm getting at is, I'm wondering if you believe that there are some Palestinians that are inherently decent or good people. Because you did mention that in the 1929 massacre, there were Arabs that did help to, to protect. But I know you said there weren't enough. For sure. I mean, they, they control most of Hebron today, um, the Arabs. Um, uh, <coughs> You know, it's very dangerous to, to stereotype. For sure, you know, not, not all Arabs are bad, okay? Not all Arabs want to kill Jews. There are people that, you know, want to live and let live. Uh, there are those that don't. Um, you find that anywhere in the world, you know, with any peoples. You know, a couple of nights ago, uh, after an election in Quebec, uh, some nuts walked in and started shooting people. I mean, you know, it happens all over the place, unfortunately. Um, uh, for sure, look, I have never said, and I've been working in this job for a long time, I have never said as a spokesman for the community that in order for us to live here, the Arabs have to leave. In any, in any given scenario, okay? They say that about us, though. Okay, they say straight out that they won't live with us. They say uh, Abu Mazen, you know, the uh, head of the PA, said that the Palestinian state has to be unified. He said, we don't want any Jews here. Okay, um, uh, I've never said that. I've never uh, insinuated that. Uh, the situation today isn't easy. It's very difficult. Things have to be. There has to be a way to try to find find a way uh, to be able to somehow live together. Um, it would have been an easier thing to deal with, you know, 15 or 20 years ago than it is today. Um, but uh, uh, but I think that that. The key is that they have to accept that we have a legitimate right to be here. And they reject that. And when I say a legitimate right to be here, I'm not talking about Hebron. And I'm not even talking about Jerusalem. I'm talking about Beersheba and Tel Aviv and Haifa. Because they say time and time again that that's Palestine. I would invite you to take a walk through the Kasbah in the back. Now, I'm not allowed to go into the Kasbah today, even though it's under the Israeli jurisdiction of Hebron, okay? I have photographs that I, I, w I went back there a couple of days ago. There was a little tour with some military personnel and, and I, was, I went on the tour with them. Um, and I have photographs that I took two days ago of a very nice box, a little, like a little jewelry box, with an inlaid map, very, very pretty little thing, of Palestine. Okay, it says Palestine, and it's the state of Israel. And that's what they want. And that's what they say, and that's the way they act. Until there's a, a, a real acceptance of the legitimacy of the Jewish people to be here in a Jewish state, it's very difficult to do anything. Because they have a goal. They're trying to achieve that goal. They're doing very well. 
I mean, you know, they, they, got, they got a lot. But then they messed it up a little because they started killing Jews and that sort of pushed them back. But they still say it. That's what Hamas says all the time. It's what Hezbollah says. You mentioned uh, our good friend up in, in, in Iran a few minutes ago. It says the same thing. You know, so that's what we have to deal with today. Uh, I'm not talking about... Look, when, we moved to Hebron, when I moved here to Hebron, there was a guy across the street here who had two hands of gold. I have two left hands. And I brought him upstairs here and I paid him a lot of money and did some very good work in my house. Uh, there were people that we used to sit and talk to and drink tea with. Um, you know, uh, today that basically is broken down. I personally think that's unfortunate. Um, but, uh, but today that's the way it is. We didn't, we didn't do it. We, did, we didn't initiate the breakdown in, in what's happened here. Yeah. Look, there are two different kinds of signs, okay? The sign that you're probably speaking about is the one that was on over where the old Arab market was just down the road here. And we put that there because it's Jewish property. And people think that it's our property. And, you know, if, if somebody says, if, 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 I, if I say to you, you know, that pen belongs to me, and you really want it, then you're going to make sure everybody knows that you know, once it belonged to you, and you might say, well, he stole my pen, you know, and every time you see me, or you see the pen, you can edit it, but you're around, you say, well, he stole it, okay? So we're not talking about a pen here, we're talking about land. Um, that's one kind of a sign, and I think that's legitimate, I don't see any problems with that. In terms of unity, uh, you know, when the time comes and everything is rosy-dozy, and, you know, we're all good friends, and, and dancing together, and hugging each other, and kissing each other, then the sign will disappear. But for the time being, unfortunately, it's not like that. Um, there are also things that are written that we don't particularly like. There's a lot of graffiti up. Uh, it's not all ours. We have caught in the past uh, people from the left writing nice things on the walls like, you know, death to the Arabs, then taking pictures of it and saying that we did it. Um, but there's also graffiti that's been put up by people either from here or people on the Israeli right, uh, which we don't particularly like. We've tried numerous times to, um, to uh, get rid of it. Uh, to paint it over, and we still haven't been allowed to. The authorities won't let us, for whatever reason. Um, and we, we feel that that's wrong, and we have tried, I think, fairly successfully to stop it, amongst, at least amongst the kids. Yeah? You've talked some about <coughs> the developmental task that has influenced the person you are today. As you think about it, this stage of your life, the legacy you want to leave, I look that old? I have to. <laughs> nah, I'm older than you. Um, um, legacy, I don't know. I don't think in terms of legacies. Um, you know, I try to do what I think is right to do um, for. Um, not necessarily for me personally, but, you know, looking back, looking, you know, in, in, from the past, you know, where we've come, to, come from, where we're going to. Um, I don't know. I don't know, you know, what do I want to leave? There are different levels of that. You know, like, you want to leave the world a better place. But my ability to influence the entire world is, you know, is fairly... No, I mean, you know, I don't have influence. I'm not, I'm not the President of the United States, and I'm not the Prime Minister of Israel. I'm an individual. Um, so I can try to work with whatever um, tools I may have or whatever talents I may think I have uh, to try to further things that I believe in because I think that that's what's best, first of all, first and foremost, um, not on a personal level of myself or my children, my family, but for the Jewish people in Israel. Um, and eventually, I think if it's eventually what will bring about a better situation in the entire world. Um, 
but it, it works in a in a in a very uh, a, in, on different levels. Um, I obviously believe that what I'm doing is is right, and what's good for for Am Yisrael, for the Jewish people. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. There are people who disagree with me. Okay, there are people that say the fact that you're here is hurting us. There are people that are here that say what you're doing here is great. There are people that say to me. You know, that I can get a letter and an email saying, you know, why do you say the Arabs should stay? You've got to throw them all out. You know, you get, it, you get hit from all directions. Um, I, I can only do, act from what I've studied, what I believe, and, and the directions that, that I personally believe with, you know, with what other tools I have to go in. What legacy that will leave? I don't know. I have no idea. I mean... I have, let's put it this way, I have no doubts whatsoever, very honestly, I have no doubts that the direction that we're moving in, where I'm coming from, is going to succeed with my definition of success. We're going to stay here. We're going to stay here. Jews are going to stay here and they're going to live here. Okay? We're not going anyplace. Nobody's throwing us out. Whether it be Hebron or Tel Aviv or anywhere, we're here to stay. Okay? And the goal isn't, isn't just to stay here. We'd like to be able to live a little bit more normally. In other words, what it means to live normally. Things that you don't even think about. Where most of you people come from, I, I expect. I want to go out and buy a house. Ahmad across the street wants to sell me his building. He says to me, I want $500,000 for the building. I come up with $500,000 and I pay him for the building. Right? I mean, it happens all over the world. It happens in New York, and it happens in London, and in Paris, and in Tokyo. But if I do that here in Hebron, then I've just signed Ahmed's death certificate. Because according to PA law, it's forbidden for him to sell property to a Jew. It's a capital crime. They kill him. And they do it. There's a guy, on, a guy who sold us a building down the road here. They captured him, and they sentenced him to death. And we put out a letter to the international community, to the UN, and to, I don't know who else, to try to save the guy. If I, even if, 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 if when I give him his suitcase with the $500,000 in it, I put him on a plane to Paris, so that they can't catch him and kill him, the Israeli government won't let me move in. Because they'll say, no, you can't move in if you didn't get a permit, not from the town planner across the street, but from the defense minister. The defense minister has to sign a permit saying that I, David Wilder, can buy a house from Ahmad. Is that normal? It's the farthest thing from normality. But that's what I'd like to be able to do. You know? I don't want to walk into Ahmad's house and, and throw him out and take it. If it belongs to him and he wants to sell it to me, then I'll buy it. That's normality. Normalcy. Here we don't have that. We don't have that luxury here. Okay? That's what I mean by success. Success is to be able to live here, to be able to grow here, to be able to live here without having to carry a Glock, without having to send my, my, my boys to the army. To live, to live normally. And we will. I have no doubt about that. That's the legacy we want, we want to achieve. That's the goal that we want to achieve. And I'm a little, you know, I'm a link in the chain and people that are doing things like that. And I have no doubt that it'll succeed. No doubt whatsoever. Does that answer your question? Sort of? There's no bad wrong answer. I'm just saying this is a joke. No, I've said a fun <laughs> <Okay>. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, okay, there are a couple. Of, take, let's take two more and then see where we go from there. Uh, the, the, the two people, the one and one. So you start and then we'll finish up with you. Yeah. Oh, I don't think there is such an animal. Look, people obviously don't vote for the left. Nobody's voting for merits. I don't think you're going to find anybody voting for labor. Um, people vote for usually the, the right-wing religious parties. Okay? There are a whole bunch of them. And different people vote for different ones. Um, you know, there's a national, national... There are two parties that are very, very similar. 
but, you know, as, as it goes, you know, you put three Jews in a room, there are four synagogues. You know, there's the one that nobody goes into. So you've got, you've got two political parties that are very similar, and people, you know, vote for whichever one the people they like in it. But that's basically the way people go. Last one. Accepting the meetings that we've had with Jabari, we've had numerous meetings with him, no. And you want to know something? I would welcome it, personally. Okay? Um, I, I, you know, there are people that I work with who would probably also welcome it, and there are probably people that wouldn't like the idea. Okay? Very honestly. I would welcome it. I'd be very happy to... I, I, I'll sit down and talk to just about anybody. Okay? It doesn't make any difference. I, I, I enjoy, I think it's important that there should be an open line of communications. I had an Egyptian, he's an Egyptian-Belgian journalist who came in, and uh, we had a very interesting discussion. He actually transcribed the whole thing, and I put it up on the web. And then I wrote and told him, and he said, great, you know, um, I don't think he agrees with a lot of what I said, but, you know, but, but I don't have any problems, you know, sitting down and talking to anybody. I have a feeling that, that the people on the other side, uh, they reject the fact that I'm here, and they say that. I don't see any way that they would sit down and talk to us. Can you, can you just comment, because there has been in the news quite a bit, about the price tag issues that you've had uh, a number of people are speaking of. Uh, it's very often, you know, at the point yeah. you hear it out about some leadership, the other kind of... Yeah, you know, well, it's, you know, finger, finger pointing is always great. You know, it, the, that's sort of like the, you know, the stereotype of, you know, well, they're all, all big, bad Arabs. So, you know, Kiryat Darba is, of course, big, bad Kiryat Arba. Um, I can't speak for Kiryat Arba. The police, the police, security forces here, the least thing that they are is bashful, especially with this kind of stuff. If they really think they have somebody, then they arrest them. Even when they don't think they have them, they arrest them just so that it, they can make people think that they're working. Um, uh, I personally think that uh, the, I, I, I don't see any reason to go out and uh, use any unnecessarily violence in any case, certainly not against, um, you know, people that don't have anything to do with anything. I thought the attack this, this week that they, first of all, have to be very careful, very, very careful, because when something is written on a wall someplace, unless it's filmed or you have a witness, you don't know who did it. And the fact that it says something on a wall um, and it seems to point in a certain direction doesn't mean that the other side didn't do it to get to you. Okay? If somebody went from the, 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 the left, went and wrote on the wall as they did in the, uh, the monastery in Latrun, what they wrote there, somebody from the left did that at night just so that they would attack us. I mean, it works great. You know, because who in the world would think that they were doing it, right? So until it's proven that so-and-so did it, you know, but I, I don't, I, I, I personally, and I think in terms of community, it's certainly not anything we back. Uh, the Israeli uh, security forces are here to deal, whether they be police or soldiers or intelligence or whatever they are, are here to deal with security threats, with terrorist threats. The problems today that we're dealing with in terms of uh, uh, Israeli government policies to rip people out of their homes and destroy their homes is a... Uh, is a, an issue that we have to deal with opposite the Israeli government, the ministers, the Knesset members, and uh, the basic Israeli leadership. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with, with Yusuf or Dawid or, or Muhammad or anybody else, or not the, uh, the monasteries or anything else. I think it's... Uh, it's uh, my, my assumption is that the people that are dealing with this are the very small number of people can be very individual kinds of things. I personally don't know of any kind of organized group, you know, or organized, uh, uh, you know, whatever that, you know, underground that's, you know, you know, it's very easy to get up in the middle of the night, you know, drive someplace or walk someplace and write something and leave and nobody knows you were there. Um, but I, I think it's unnecessary. It certainly doesn't further anything that we believe in. 
and uh, and I think it should stop. Thank you so much.